No self-respecting, or at least the manufacturer striving to be a self-respecting model train manufacturer's range would be complete without a detailed range of freight cars and passenger cars to be pulled along by their locomotives. Bachmann, needless to say, was no exception there, as it was trying to really break into the market. It had, of course, a lot of inherited products from its former company owners that it would continue to enhance and work with, but it would also come up with new ideas as time went on. Let's take a look at a few of these models up close and in detail. This multi-dome six-axle tank car is one of Bachmann's more unusual products. Like most of the products in the late 70s era that this car was built in, it lacks weight, even though it was composed of very heavy and durable plastic. The company also made some higher quality cars like this flat composed again of six axles, using actual metal axles between the wheels themselves to apply a little bit more weight to the chassis in an effort to make them hold down to the rails better. The fact is, this never worked and there's really no replacement for good old fashioned metal weights. Another example of this is this plastic grain car, again composed of plastic wheels, plastic trucks, but with a metal screw to hold the trucks down in place. But again, not lacking weight and not really good for backing up a main line unless you enjoy picking your cars off a concrete floor. Not fun and not recommended. The same could be said for this plastic box car. Then there were cars like this caboose that actually had metal constructions on top to try to give them some weight down on the rails. Even though they once again lacked the metal wheels and had plastic wheels and plastic trucks, they actually did a decent job of sticking to the tracks when pushed and pulled around the layout. I should know, I had quite a few of these when I was a kid. Bachmann often sold them with a matching locomotive. And if this caboose looks kind of familiar to those who have been around Bachmann in more recent years, well, just take a good ander at this particular caboose. And yes, this was the caboose that came with that Coastliner train set I reviewed earlier. As you can see, essentially it is the same model, only with the couplers mounted to the actual base of the car instead of truck mounted, and of course knuckles instead of horn hooks. Other than that, same basic design with the plastic wheels included. The same again could be said for this coal hopper car, again plastic wheels with screws to hold the trucks in place, again that's the main difference in the 70s as opposed to the 80s cars, although this 1990s produced co coach has the same basic ability. And for those of you out there who think I'm exaggerating and that no model railroad company would keep something in production this long, well, give your goose a gander at this. As we can see from the top, they are exactly the same, no changes whatsoever, except again the new one is in the CSX paint scheme, which was not available in the 80s for, well, obvious reasons, and the Union Pacific paint scheme is of course the one available in the 80s because, well, that was available back in the day. But the designs are the same, the smokestacks are the same, the detailing is the same. The only real difference is the paint scheme, and again, the placement of the couplers, and the fact that the couplers are knuckles instead of horn hooks. I must, however, and will, however, freely admit that despite the fact that these cabooses have not changed at all, all or much at all, in all that time, I still use them on a frequent basis on my layout to this day. Of course, mine are upgraded to Silver Series specs, which is to say they now have metal wheels as well as sprung knuckle couplers, not horn hooks, and not the ABS sprung crappy ones you get when you buy one of these in a train set or as a standard line product from Bachmann. So I guess this is a case in which doing things the old-fashioned way is the right way. Old Fashioned describes this particular car, even though it was made in the 80s and used the more modern plastic bolt to hold the trucks in place. Everything else was a hand-me-down with plastic wheels and plastic trucks. The plastic button or bolt was very notorious as it could break very easily. This is again one of the downgrades in quality that occurred during the 1980s for the line. All of these freight cars have another unfortunate trademark that they all share. They will 9 out of 10 times be fine as long as you go forward and not backwards. Uh, remember how I said 9 out of 10 hey, times? Because yes, even if you do follow those practices, this did not guarantee the cars would be fine some way of jumping the tracks. A note in the boxes that most rolling stock came in from Bachmann during this period in the 1970s usually got this box with this white and gold trim on it. Later on, this is probably more familiar to those of you like myself who were around in the 80s and 90s as a child, you got these red and white boxes with the Bachmann logo on the side. And now let's move on to the more modern series of freight cars that Bachmann continues to make to this day, the Silver Series. As we can see, the packaging differs drastically from what Bachmann has produced in the past, and for good reason. These cars are really built to a much different standard, even if they are essentially reissues with some tweaks from the original rolling stock. As we open the package up, we can see that Bachmann really made a big effort to make this product look high-end. Save for some, shall we say, unique wording as to how to get the actual caboose out of the actual packaging itself. 
After quite a bit of struggling and messing around, I finally was able to extract this caboose out of its packaging. As you can see, like all Silver Series products, it has the metal wheels as well as metal sprung couplers, and better detailing underneath the body than normal. We also see the very nicely applied paint to all the little detailed sections, including the upper grab irons on top of the actual cupola of the caboose itself. The wheels did initially run a little rough, this had been sitting in the package for a while, so I fixed this by putting some lubricant on them. Labelle 107 to be precise. And now I have a rather stunning admission to make, which in my opinion is the equivalent of Speed Racer announcing he can't drive stick. So please be sure you are seated comfortably and do not have a gulp of whatever you're drinking in your mouth at this time. I love the Bachmann Silver Series freight cars. In fact, they're some of the only freight cars anyone has noticed my layout that I really use for the most part. The main reason for this is I find right out of the box they are the most trouble-free car to get around the layout without modifying with weights, different wheels, etc. Take this small string of three flat Bachmann Silver Series flat cars being pulled out of Midville Yard now by my Conrail RS11. HO scale flat cars are some of the more infamous to keep on the rails. The main reason being is they don't have a lot of mass in general, and when loaded, as most of the loads available for these types of cars tend to be heavier than the cars themselves, they become very top-heavy. This causes them to have a nasty tendency to want to literally roll off the tracks after going around tight turns and or through switch points. But as we'll see, the Bachmann Silver Series flat cars perform very well in these sort of circumstances. And just to prove just how capable these particular Bachmann Silver Series flat cars are, I will now proceed to back them up Whitestone Mountain through a series of tight turns and then into a very tight siding at the top of Whitestone Mountain. Note, backing a model train up is always more challenging than pulling a train up a mountain, reason being is more force is put on the cars themselves. If not properly weighted, they can easily jump the track or simply fall off altogether. And as we see, despite the steep grade, the tight turns, and being pushed through several switch points, the tr none of the cars derailed at all, and they all arrived safely at the siding. Next, let's move on to the passenger cars and or coaches that Bakken provided. Here we have some old-timer passenger cars. One might think they're all the same, but look closely and we see that there are subtle and very noticeable differences. The first car review actually has the 
couplers mounted to the frame itself and metal wheels while the second car we are now looking at has the couplers mounted to the trucks and of course has plastic wheels. The same can be said by the other car on the far left that we're looking at at this time. While they all might seem very similar, they're all from very different eras. The car with the actual metal wheels is a silver series coach, while the other two are from two different eras, believe it or not. One is from the 80s, the other is actually from the 90s. No changes were made during this period of these particular models. Sometime in the early 2000s, however, one minor change did occur. The couplers moved out to the actual frames of the coaches, not the actual trucks, and they were upgraded to basic knuckle couplers, the Mark I types, as Bachman refers to them as. Taking a look under the hood of these coaches, which as you can see were very nicely and very well attached, there really isn't very much to see, just a big metal weight in the middle, and I might add not, not that heavy of a metal weight, secured by two plastic bolts. This is very similar to the way the, the Bachman standard line of freight cars was produced. As it also be noted that the early run of these particular coaches back in this era did not hold the rails very well, much like their freight car counterparts, not surprising considering they followed the same recipe. The focus again on this era of Bachmann was more about keeping prices down and underpricing the competition, not necessarily making sure that the models actually performed the way they were supposed to, and they suffered for this greatly. The logic being, of course, that Bachmann, who had recently introduced its lifetime limited warranty, could simply repair anything that didn't work correctly. They hadn't seemingly counted on design flaws being one of the main concerns. With much time and effort, I was finally able to separate the Silver Series from its base. And as we can see, things are a little bit different. The weight is noticeably heavier than the original unit, allowing it to hold the rails better. We also note the plastic use of secure it is in definite better shape, and not done so cheaply as it's deformed already on the older model on the, t on, the on the top, while the new Silver Series, as we see on the bottom, looks a lot sharper, and of course less corroded, dictating its age again. And here's one final underbody shot to show the main differences. Again, the... Silver Series having these separately applied couplers, while the other two have the couplers attached to the trucks. Well, as I go slow there, it's fine. Not sure exactly why that turn is such a big deal for it. It's a very small turn. Let's try to see if we can switch over to the third track again. And as we can see with this Liberty Bell Special, which does use two of those type Silver Series old-time coaches, Despite the fact that the locomotive is very clearly jumping and stuttering all over the place, the coaches are staying nicely on the track and holding the rails beautifully. Now let's talk about one of the more, shall we say, famous coaches Bachmann produced, especially in its earlier era, and that would be the Amtrak Amfleets. These cars were derived from the Metroliner, which is another car that Bachmann produced as well. As we can see from first glance, these cars look pretty well much the part, as I believe the expression is. Especially for the era that these coaches were produced in, this one being an earlier Mark I variation, shall we say, of these coaches that, produ that were produced in 1975 until sometime into the late 80s. As you can see, the wheels are realistic in terms of how they have that hubless design that Bud put into these. Now, for those of you out there who think I am basically taking it too far by saying these coaches were very nicely done for the era, to have a look at this footage I took from my recent trip down to Orlando via Amtrak. As we can see, while the detailing is a bit on the crude side, especially for the era, it's very close to the real thing. It really isn't that far off. And we also have to remember, these coaches were designed in the late 70s. The era of extremely cheap model trains with plastic wheels and bed running motors and lack of detail. Also, unlike a lot of the other rolling stock Bachman made at this period of time, these coaches hold the rails beautifully, and they look beautiful behind that period correct Amtrak F9, which is also built by Bachman. Even if the blade nose extends a little bit too far back beyond the cab, Now let's move on to a slightly lesser well-known particular 
product that Bachman produced, and that is the Metroliner. These coaches are what, again, as I mentioned before, the in real life, Am the Amfleet 2 and Amfleet 1 coaches would be based upon. Obviously, the Metroliner being self-propelled, high-speed rail commuter cars, some of the first in the nation. The cars in real life didn't work out for Amtrak as they proved to be too maintenance, maintenance and or trouble prone to be worth keeping in service. The variations for Bachmann were about the same as the self-propelled motors tended to be too weak to actually haul the cars around the tracks, which incidentally was one of the issues that the real-life counterparts actually struggled with. It wasn't uncommon to find a train of these Metroliner cars being hauled by a locomotive such as a GG1, E60CP, or one of Amtrak's then brand new AEM7s. Now, in case anyone out there is wondering why Bachman was able to pretty much get all these little details so well nailed, especially for the era for these particular coaches, it's really quite simple. You see, Bachman had signed up someplace very early on, somewhere in the late 70s, to be the official modeler of the Bud Company's passenger car equipment, including the Amfleet 2s, Amfleet 1s, and of course the Bud Dome cars, as well as the actual, as we saw there, a, a Metroliner cars. When Kadar took over Bachman, they continued to produce these models and would make upgrades as time progressed. Unfortunately, the Metroliner cars were excluded from this and were not upgraded beyond a certain point, and were eventually phased out sometime in the early 80s. When I realized that unfortunately I had purchased dummy coaches instead of actually purchasing a powered set, or and or at least one with a powered coach, and found that getting a powered coach was simply too expensive, and that they had a terrible reputation for mechanical failures, my original plan was to simply pull them along with an engine such as an E60CP. Unfortunately, I found that getting one in running condition was worthy of a soap opera, as you have seen in my previous films. So at the, for the time being, this is about the best I can do for showcasing these models, as they are unpowered. Hopefully sometime in the future I'll finally get an E60CP that actually works, so I can drag one of these behind it. Here are some shots of the units. As you can see, they have pantographs, one on each unit. They also have the cab front, as I have shown off in a few of the earlier shots. Again, this was mainly due to the fact that Bachman got the official rights to produce models of Bud's cars in HO scale, as well as N scale. As decent a job as Bachman did detailing these units, they did miss a few spaces. As we can see by the base, it's kind of Fred Bear and Baron down there. I'm sure there was more than just a simple piece of plastic underneath the real-life model. Overall, a very decent effort by Bachman, especially considering what it had to work with at the time. While the Metroliner coaches again did reach end of life sometime around the 80s, the same could not be said, luckily, for the M Fleet cars. They were upgraded a few times, one minor upgrade in the very late 90s, which gave them separately applied couplers and knuckle couplers, which were Mark 1s, and then on to the famous and now budding Silver Series somewhere in the earlier 2000s. This drastically overhauled the coaches with new blackened wheels that looked very realistic, but more updated detailing underneath the car body itself, as well as a multi-zone lighting system. The packaging, as we can see, is standard Bachman Silver Series. As I remove this coach from its box, it becomes very clear that Bachman is trying to make an impression on its current customers to let them know that they had drastically updated this coach, and it's hard not to notice that. The blackened wheels, the underbody detail, as I mentioned before, really stick out. But again, you don't need to take my word for it, just have a gander of that footage I spliced in in the corner. In addition to the underbody detailing being a little bit more higher def in terms of in terms of how it sticks out, there are a few other little tweaks I'd like to also point out on the model, such as these end marker lights, which now have their own separate lighting zone, so they cast a lo long light beam. The coach also now features functioning diaphragms that move in and out, as well as left to right. The underside, though, beyond the little side details, is a little bit on the bearing side, which is a simple piece of plastic. Admittedly, I think it's a little bit more detailed than that in real life, as I haven't been underneath the coach, but still, I don't think that's much of a stretch to believe they could have done a better job here. 
The updated lighting system now supported by LEDs, and again, the three zones really shows its worth, as unlike before, where you saw the coaches were kind of partially lit here and there, you can now see the very specific detailing very easily inside. And as you can see, the end marker lights now very clearly light up inside the coaches. We also have those nice little detail lights on the top that show the classification of the coach. I should also point out that while these coaches are from the current run, they are essentially the same coach that was proud of production in the early 2000s. All Bachmann essentially did, as usual, was to reissue this model and basically increase the price notably. I believe it's now up to $89 for retail from Bachmann. Of course, you can find them for like $69 or so from your local hobby shop. It would have been nice if Bachmann added some detailing to these coaches, especially especially since the prices are now approaching what Walters wants for their particular version of these coaches, which I might add is better detailed and better proportioned in a few ways that these coaches aren't. While it would appear from this footage that the test run of these coaches went very smoothly, that couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, the wheels were dragging so badly that the locomotive could not even haul these cars around the track. And yes, that locomotive is a QSI-equipped Atlas Master Series locomotive with the heavily weighted eight-wheel drive system that is known for having massive pulling power. That's really all you need to know. I have to say, these new coaches are pretty fussy. Best I can tell, they didn't like the locomotive I hooked them up to. Yeah, they're Bachmann coaches, but apparently they don't get along with, At with Atlas locomotives. Whatever the case, putting them on the train and trying to run the round the first time was a challenge, as essentially this engine just wheel slipped its way around the tracks. It got stuck on several of the curves and just could not move them. The axles were that, that badly not free. In other words, they were that badly locked up, if you will. They still turned, but boy, they were not free at all. After making a few revolutions now around the rail, around the main loop on the outside there, as you see, they're running fine. So I worked this new camera here. But still, that was a lot of effort, in my opinion, for what wasn't what shouldn't have been such a big deal. Still, despite the flaws in these coaches, it's hard not to look at them and not be impressed. Although there are a few annoying quirks, I'm not sure how well it came out in some of those shots. But if you look closely, you can just barely make out the wiring that's actually running through the LED lights inside some of the coaches. This is not consistent, and it's unfortunate. Apparently, Bachman needs to start writing its factories to make sure the quality it's is consistent with all the models. This is especially recommended if Bachman really wants to play in the big leagues with locomotives and cars priced at these levels. Now, while there were obviously more pieces available to Bachman customers back in the day, I'm afraid I'm going to have to end my look at the Bachman freight cars and coaches at this point, as, to be honest, most of the other models simply aren't available anymore due to the age and with the cheapness in which they were constructed by Bachman. And again, I'd like to give some credit and a shout-out to hoseeker.net. If it wasn't for their free archive, I couldn't have gotten the info I needed. Again, not sponsored. I'd just like to point them out just to give credit where credit is due. And that's going to about do it for this part of the Bachman documentary. I may do a few more sections on this depending on what the demand is and if I can find more material. If you liked it, thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, keep the metal side down.